Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, um, if you study, he wrote two letters to the Corinthians. This was a church that Paul had planted in Corinth. And uh, that's what Paul did. He traveled around and he started churches in different places. And then as he would travel on, he would keep in touch with them to try to pastor them, to try to lead them in, a, in the way that was right and make sure they were firmly established in the gospel. Um, and of all the churches that Paul had, we, we see that he had a different problem in each of these churches that he would write to. There was a different challenge that he faced with each of them. But this church at Corinth was probably the most troubled church that he had. They had all kinds of, it was, it was, a, it was a, a congregation that was just not getting along very well. They had trouble accepting the gospel. They had trouble receiving what Paul had preached to them. They had trouble leaving their idolatrous past. They were pagans before and they had trouble leaving that behind and, and clinging to the gospel of Jesus. They had trouble with false teachers coming up in their, in their church and, and trying to lead the people astray. They even had problems with, I mean, they even questioned Paul's authority as an apostle. They even had people coming into that church and saying, you don't need to listen to what old Paul says because he didn't even see Jesus in the flesh, so how could he be an apostle? And, and we see in his letters that Paul defends himself and he defends his authority as a man of God. Well, Paul was dealing with all this and, and he, he goes to the church in Corinth and he preaches to them and he's a little bit rough on them. He, he, um, he kind of lines them out in, in very strict terms and rightfully so, but the people being uh, as so immature in the faith, the people in the church thought that Paul just didn't love them anymore. He, they got their feelings hurt. And so we find in the rest of chapter 6 you have Paul reassuring how much he loves the, this church, reassuring them that the reason he's so tough on them and the reason that he, he preaches the gospel with such ferocity is because he wants them to succeed. But, and, and you guys can read that for the rest of the week, but, but for the short time that we have this morning, I want to focus on what I think are the most uh, the two most interesting verses of this chapter. So if you'll look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 says, We then... As workers together with Him, Paul talking about Him and God, we then as workers together with God beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Amen. For He saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul quoting, from the book of Isaiah there. When he said today, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. What struck me as I read that this week was that last part of the first verse. It says, We then, as workers together with Him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Now some people have said that this, and what 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 struck me was this concept of receiving grace, but receiving it in vain. And some people have suggested that what Paul was actually talking about, he was urging this church to be reconciled with him, with Paul. But Paul says the grace of God. So, so I don't know if that's exactly right. He's writing to this church. It's a church. It's a group of converts. It's a group of Christians. And he's instructing them not to receive grace in vain. It seems that he's suggesting that you can be saved. Come on, buddy. You can have the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away all of your sins. Prepared and ready to go to heaven. But yet you have received that grace in vain. Now to understand this, we first need to think about what some, having something in vain means. It means to no effect. Uh -huh. So what Paul is saying, you have received grace, but you've received grace 
to no effect. You've received grace, but it hasn't had any effect on it. We also need to think about what grace is. And Paul kind of lines that out. If you do have your Bibles, look at chapter 5. Chapter 5 and 17. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. To put that in layman's terms, in verse 19 he says, Though God had every right, to impute judgment on us. To charge us for our trespasses against Him. He waived that judgment. And instead have, have reconciled us. Have brought us back together with God. How did He do that? Verse 21 tells us. It says, He hath made Him. God hath made Jesus. To be sin. Who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We talk about how Jesus took on our sins. Come on, buddy. But Paul takes it a step farther. He's saying that Jesus didn't just take on our sins. He became sin. Let's explain that. Jesus... When He was on the cross, see, when mankind disobeyed God in the garden so many years ago, sin came into the world. And God, we know, cannot look on sin. Mm -hmm. But God being the kind of God He Come is, on, decided there had to be a way around it. So the only way to get rid of this sin and reconcile men back to God, to bring men back into the communion that we were supposed to have with God was to destroy sin. So when Jesus, and I don't know exactly how this worked, but when Jesus was hanging on that cross, in God's eyes, He was destroying sin. Jesus, who lived a life as no other person had ever lived, had on, kept every jot and tittle of that law, every bit, every, every comma and, and period and semicolon of the law, Jesus had kept it all, had never sinned one time in His entire life. God chose to impute the sins of all mankind up until that point and forever after that point onto His only begotten Son. So when Jesus was hanging on the cross dying, that wasn't just Jesus dying, that was sin dying. Paul says He became sin, who know no sin, so that we could be made righteous. That is grace. That is what Paul was talking about when he said grace. That is not just grace. That is the very definition of grace. I looked up the definition of grace. It says kind or forgiving treatment of someone who could be treated harshly. Mm. Kind or forgiving treatment of someone who could be treated harshly. See, there was no getting around the fact that God would, would punish sin in some way or another. That is what God does. God being perfect, God being righteous has no choice but to persecute sin. God has no choice but to judge sin. And God, up until Jesus became our ultimate sacrifice, had no choice but to condemn us to hell because of our sin. But He found a way around it by making His own Son sin. Grace is kind or forgiving treatment of someone who could have been treated harshly. 
Paul said he did not impute our trespasses on us, but instead he reconciled us. So somehow we are dealing with a bunch of people who have received this grace that the church of Corinthians received. They received this grace. It's the same grace that all believers receive when you repent of your sins and accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ onto your life. It's the same sacrifice that every Christian has received, but somehow, someway, they have received this thing to no effect. Uh-huh. Oh, what? what does that mean? They have received it, but yet not been affected by it. Is that possible? I think it is. I think it's probably one of the most rampant problems in the Christian church today, just as it was in, in Corinth. We have received grace, but we have received it, and it has not affected us. Because we receive this grace, but we go on living like we never received it in the first place. Let me tell you what grace does. Grace cleanses us from our sins. It makes us, as Paul wrote in chapter 5, new creatures. And it reconciles us with God. So let's take that first part. It cleanses us from our sins. We can receive grace in vain if we have been cleansed from our sins and yet continue to live like we never received that grace. Like we have never been cleansed. We can wallow in our past sins. We can remember and we can, we can just bring up our past sins and our past failings over and over and over again. Although God has forgiven us of them, God does not remember them. But we keep bringing them up and we keep feeling unworthy and we keep feeling unworthy of God's love. Because we forget that we receive that grace. That grace is to no effect to us because we act like we never got it in the first place. I want you to consider Paul this morning. Before he had his name changed and before he became a preacher, Paul was a man who considered himself very righteous and That's very right, upright. Brother. And he was doing what he thought <laughs> God wanted him to do. But Paul, you can read in the book of Acts, was present for the stoning of Stephen one of the first martyrs after the crucifixion of Jesus. He held the coats of the people as they stoned Stephen. He orchestrated the murder of a Christian believer. Yep. Not only that, Paul would travel around the countryside busting up Christian churches. That's right. He would go into those places, hold swords to their throats, and force them to recant their belief in Jesus Christ. Force them to deny that Jesus Christ was their Savior. And if they didn't do that, He Be would him. kill them. Yeah. Paul did this for years. Come on. And that's why Jesus, when He stopped Paul on the road to Damascus, said, Saul, why do you persecute me? Uh -huh. Paul committed all of these Come terrible on, acts. Paul was a murderer. Yes, he Paul was, was a, an enemy of the church. Right, exactly. But later he would write, forgetting all those things. Yeah. Amen. Hey, Bless you. I pressed toward the mark. Paul could have wallowed in his sin for the rest of his life, and he wouldn't have achieved anything as a minister. Paul had so many sins stacked against his account, the terrible, awful things that he had done to innocent people. Had he not received that grace as God intended it, had he not taken Jesus at his word, that his Come on, sins were forgiven, Bless you. Paul would have been of no effect as a minister. Paul would have driven himself crazy if he would have dwelled on these past sins. But Paul realized that they were were forgiven and Paul didn't have to feel bad about them anymore because Jesus is hey, Grace of Except God. forgetting those things which are behind me, I'll press toward the mark of the high call. Hey. Hey. Zach, before you go any farther, I want you to share your testimony with this group well, on the I was, I front was seat about how you used to how you used to take the grace in vain. Well that that was my next point as well. Alright. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now that Paul the, the other thing that, that grace does for it, it makes us a new creature. Yeah. And, and to receive grace in vain means to forget that we are new creatures. But not just that, it means to forget who made us into that new creature. Amen. See, I, uh, and, and as, as Dad was saying, I, I tell you this from personal experience. Listen, young folks. I have been, I have been changed. Right, I, I was saved from a young age, and I was changed. I was made into that new creature that Paul talked about. My heart was cleansed, but I forgot 
that it wasn't me that did the cleaning. And I forgot that it wasn't me that did the changing. Why is it, and, and, and I've been so guilty of this, why is it that we act like the sacrifice of Jesus is enough to cleanse any sinner? That's what we say. Amen. It's enough to cleanse any sinner, on, no Zach. matter how wretched. Come on, Zach. It's enough to clean them and make them a new creature, spotless, as if they had never committed a sin. And it is. That's true. No matter what you've done. But then we act like as soon as you become a Christian, everything's up to you. At that point, the blood of Jesus Christ, He saved you. Now you've got to go the rest of the way You're on your right. own. You're right, John. I lived for years, Come on, lived for years, trying on my own to perfect myself. Listen, I acted Christian. like this, this Christian walk was just a, 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 a challenge for me to become perfect. Well, I wasn't perfect before I got saved. And the only reason I became gained any kind of righteousness after I got saved is because of Jesus' sacrifice for me. I didn't have anything to do with it. Amen. Amen. I lived for years trying by myself to perfect myself, to keep God's law. I lived just as those uh, Israelites in the Old Testament did. I was trying to keep the law. And I kept finding myself coming up short. And I kept acting like I was... This constant, I was in this constant state of failure and I was in this constant state of worry. But I had forgot I had received grace in vain Amen. because I forgot that it wasn't me that did the changing in the first place. If I was ever going to change, if I was ever going to become a better person, if I was ever going to grow closer to Jesus, it was me asking Jesus again, Lord, change me. Lord, sanctify me. Lord, make me better. Because I can't do this. And then it's me working with Him, yeah. Him working through me, that I ever achieved anything. Yes. I can't change myself. I never could change myself. Before I got saved, I couldn't change myself. After I got saved, I can't change myself. The only change I can hope for is what He works through me. And sure, I try to keep His commandments, but I don't... It's not because I'm trying to... You know what? I, I, I eventually came to realize that me acting like I could do all this myself was a slap in the face to Jesus. I'm saying, Jesus, I don't need your sacrifice anymore. Jesus, I don't need your blood anymore. I can do this on my own. How much more victorious I realize that any good that comes through me Amen. is because of that blood that was shed oh, yeah. by Him that knew no sin, but became my sin. I forgot I was a new creation, but more importantly, I forgot who did the creator. I also talked about reconciliation. This has been the hardest thing to break myself of. For years I lived with this image of God as a great rule keeper. Yeah. Who followed me around waiting for me to fail. Yeah. So he could catch me in my failings and condemn me to hell. To hell. Yeah. Lived like that for years. I forgot. I took in vain that by Christ's sacrifice I was reconciled to my Father. As if I had as if mankind had never fallen. As if the Garden of Eden had never happened. Although I am Adam's seed. Although I am a descendant of fallen man, Christ's sacrifice has reconciled me and everybody else as if none of that had ever happened. God is not a great rule keeper waiting for me to mess up. God is a compassionate, loving, there's a reason we call Him Father. Jesus called Him Abba in the New Testament. You know what Abba was? That's not Father, that's Daddy. Amen. Bless the Lord. God is not some... Father with a belt ready to whip me every time. He is a Father who sees my failings and yeah. understands them. Works with you. And loves them. Hey, hey, Thank you. Hallelujah. Jesus has reconciled me. We can receive grace in vain. And many people do by not acting like we had grace in the first place. 
we can receive grace and give it to no effect if we forget that we received it in the first place and continue to live and act like we never got it. Now there's another way to receive grace in vain too. There is a growing movement in the Christian church, and it distresses me, that suggests that because of the sacrifice of Jesus, Jesus having reconciled all mankind, therefore Jesus' blood and sacrifice was so powerful that nobody, no human who has ever lived will see hell. There are books being written, there are Christian commentators who are buying into this thing, they believe that because Jesus was, His blood was shed abroad, that no one will see hell because of that. Whether you accept Jesus or not, you are saved. You'll die and you'll wind up in heaven and God will just say, Surprise! You're saved! <laughs> Even though you didn't do anything to accept it, though you showed no thanksgiving to Jesus or God while you were living, though you did not... Maybe you even claimed yourself an unbeliever. You denied the existence of God. Maybe you blasphemed against Him. You'll, you'll die and wake up and, and God will say, Welcome to heaven. I wish that were true. It's not to is it, so. There are so many preachers in this world who love to condemn people to hell. You know what I mean? You've heard them too. Like they're just, they, it's just like they can't wait. Like you see the joy in their eyes when they talk about sin. And they just can't wait to send all these sinners to hell. They're going to get what's coming to them. And I feel like talking to the preacher and, and just saying, you better be glad you don't have what's coming to you. You better be glad that you don't have to, that your, the, the judgment that was supposed to be imputed to you has been waived. Because... We are all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't understand why somebody would so gleefully condemn somebody to hell. And let me tell you this morning, I wish that there were no places hell. I wish that if there, that, that even if, if these people acknowledge that there was a hell, I wish that everybody didn't have to go there. I wish it was just a place for, for the devil and his angels. I wish it was just a punishment for them and not for people who disobeyed God. But reading the Bible and studying the Scriptures, I can't back that up. Thankfully though, those people are a little bit correct. In that the blood of Jesus Christ is enough to reconcile all of mankind. No matter what they have done, as long as they accept the grace that has been provided. It is powerful enough to save the whole world. The only thing required is that we accept it. I don't know why people like to make this thing this hard. This beautiful, wonderful thing of Christianity, this grace that has been given to all of us, is there and available. And all we have to do, listen, all we have to do, all we have to do, nothing that we do, nothing that we can accomplish, all that we have to do, all that is required of you is that you say, Jesus, I want that. Yes. That's all that it takes. We make it so hard. That's all it takes. We are reconciled to our Heavenly Father as if the Garden of Eden, as if the fall of man had never occurred. We are reconciled to our Father just by saying, God, give me that grace. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. All mankind has received grace. It's just up to us to use it. And this is how you can receive grace and receive it in vain. You have heard of His forgiveness. If you had never heard of it before this morning, you've heard of it now. You know of Jesus' sacrifice for us, who knew no sin but loved us so much that He became sin and subjected Himself to a terrible, cruel death so that we could live as God first intended in happiness, in peace, Amen. free of the sin that destroys yes. our lives. Yes, sir. You've heard of it. It's available, but you can receive it in vain by not accepting it. Let me tell you this. This, this, this will be humorous, I think. And you guys will understand it maybe better than some of the other people. I worked with a lady. She's been at the newspaper. I don't want to say her name. But she, she's been there for a very long time. She got there probably about when they were bringing computer, taking the typewriters out and bringing computers. 
She predated the internet. I went to school in the newsroom. You might have. So as long as she's worked there, they have had computers. But barely. Um, and last week, um, she had typed something in our word processor where we write our stories. And our graphic designer couldn't find the, the file, like on the computer. He couldn't find where she had written it. So he said, I'll just email it to you. So I overheard her. And she said, okay. Or, or no, no, no. Our graphic designer told me to have her email it to me. So I went and relayed the message. And she said, okay, I'll retype it. And I said, well, you don't have to retype it. Just copy and paste it. Over. And, and for those of you who might not know, if you have text on a computer, you can just copy, you can just drag your mouse over it and highlight it. And then you click copy, and it makes a copy of that. And then you go somewhere else, maybe into an email or maybe into another document, and you just hit paste. And all that stuff you copied over here goes over here. Huh. <laughs> but in 30 years, having this ability, all this time, she had no idea how to copy and paste from a document. So it, it blew my mind. And I just thought, I said, I was thinking, like, how many times <laughs> has she had to move, like, a sentence from here over here? And instead of just copying and pasting it in, like, seconds, she typed, she prints more stuff than anybody in the entire office, too. <laughs> So I thought, she's printing all that stuff out just to walk over to the printer and get it and then come back to her computer and then retype it over here when she could have been done in literally seconds. She has had this, like this is not a new thing. This was invented pretty much alongside the computer. Like the old gray Macintoshes they sold had this capability. This is not new. She had had this power all this time. In vain. It had existed and was within her reach. But yet she made things so much harder on herself yeah, she's there. because she didn't take advantage of it. And I also thought, like, now that I've showed her that, she probably thinks that's the best thing in the entire world. <laughs> like something that I've taken for granted for years. She probably thinks that's like the best invention since sliced bread. <laughs> but that is exactly what millions of Come people on, sir. are Come going on. through on this earth. Today. Hey, man. They have had right their their entire tips. lives. Oh. They've had this ability and this power to change their lives, yeah. to make their yeah. lives better, yeah. and have not taken advantage of it. Yeah. It was within reach. Just like grace is within reach. But it's of no use unless you use it. I don't have to, if, if you're here and, and you're lost this morning. Go ahead, sir. I'm of the opinion that I don't need to tell you how lost you are. Come on, sir. I'm of the opinion that I don't need to tell you how full of sin your life is. And I don't need to tell you how in need you are of reconciliation with God. I don't need to tell you about the void that's in your life that can't be filled. Amen. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. Yeah. yeah. You're right. You know that already. If you're like me, you already know how broken you are. I, I, I worry sometimes that, that churches are viewed as these museums of the holy. Where holy good people go to be with other holy good people. On, Instead bro. of what they actually are, and they're hospitals, they're field hospitals for the brothers. And if you are under the impression that after you become saved that the, 
the, the failings of the flesh will no longer be of any effect to you, you are sadly mistaken. Come on, you sir. are thinking that Christians, once you were saved, that these Christians around here are so holy and perfect Come that they on, can man. never relate to the way you live, that they can never relate to the way the struggles that you have, you are sadly mistaken. Because there is a reason we identify ourselves as sinners saved by grace. Amen. Yes. It's not that we are any better than anyone. It is not that we are any less broken than anyone else. It's not that we are we fail any less than anyone else. We just have what John wrote and called an advocate oh, with the Father. Glory to God. That Hallelujah. We fail. We have someone who will plead our case. Come on, son. Amen. I don't need to tell you how much you need God. I don't need to tell you how much you need reconciliation. I don't need to tell you how much you need to receive this grace because if you are anything like me, you already know how much you need it. What I can tell you is that grace is available. Who you are, no matter what you've done, God created you as you are. God loves you. God wants you to be reconciled to Him. Stand, church. Do not receive grace in vain. Glory to God. Come on. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Go ahead, Zach. Every head bowed and every eyes closed here this morning. God knows your heart. I ask Chris. I asked Jeremy to come up here to Zach and they're going to come around this altar this morning. I appreciate how that God's a moving and I thank God for how that He shows us His grace and His mercy. You're here this morning. I, I wanted Zach to tell, especially these young people, I'm not picking on them. But so many times as a church, maybe or as as we as we think matured Christians that oh we know it all and sometimes we don't have patience that we need with our young people and our youth. But we're all still in the same boat. Zach was talking about how that for a long time that he he man served this God that he thought that was standing up there with a big whip or a big sword ready to destroy him every time he messed up. But he didn't. He didn't see him in the kind of God that he is that he's, has, as Paul said, we cry, Abba, Father. Well, there's a difference in a daddy. And uh, I've heard him say so many times and I agree. Men thinks it's, it's a great thing and, and they think that it's all power and it's something to be amazed at if they father a child. But I'm here to tell you that what's great is when a, when a man is a daddy to a child. Amen. Yeah. Or the same way. And, and, and we've, I've dealt with people that so often and I've been dealing with one here lately that this young lady has been informed that she'd never be able to bear children. I'll tell you what, it takes a special lady. All kinds of people can be a mother to give birth to a child. But it takes a special woman to be a mommy. Hallelujah forevermore. We don't serve a God that stands up there. He's now after He got us. We're going we're to do exact, exactly as He says all the time. We're going to get a hundred on our spiritual report card or we're going to get plumped. I'm not preaching once in grace. I'm not preaching once you're saved you can live any kind of hellish life and still go there. I'm not preaching that. But I'm telling you as long as your heart is in a place that you want to please God. Sure, the Word says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Peter went to a place that he had walked with God and promised Jesus that he would never ever betray. But he did. 
right when Jesus needed him. But oh, Peter come back and repented and turned out to be one of the greatest men that, that God used in the Bible. One of the greatest ministers. Do you hear this morning, you young people, if you'd like as Jeremy and Zach and Chris would gather around this altar this morning, make it a little bit easier for you. If you're in the same boat that I've talked to Chris and I've talked to Jeremy, Jeremy struggled with his uh, depression, with his anxiety attacks. And these guys are just like you. But look what God has done. Good. Look what God has done in their lives. As they kneel at this altar this morning, and you say, I'm going to go pray with them guys. I, 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 I don't want to take this grace in vain. I know that God has saved me. How many of you young people will gather around this altar with these young men that's walked where you walked? Say, guys, I took grace in vain too. And I don't want to do that, but I want to. I want to utilize. And I want the grace to be alive in my life. Could you do that while every head's bowed? Every eye closed. Which one of you young people be the first to step out and say, I don't want to take grace in vain, but I want to experience it as real to my life. Could you do that? Heavenly Father, you know the need this morning. Father, I know that there's somebody really wanting to come to this altar. I want to tell you something. Just because you come to this altar don't mean that you're a sinner. Don't mean that because you're hell bound that this is your place of refuge. And I would ask you as we pray that you would come. God's bidding you to come for a reason. Step out. You may be the very leader that folks around you needs to follow. Will you step out and say, I'll be the leader. I'll be the first to say that I've taken the grace of God in vain. Bless the Lord. Come on. Hallelujah forever. Oh, I've taken the grace of God in vain. And I've looked at him as being someone that's real critical to me. But this morning I realize he's not so critical. He's loving and understanding. Praise the Lord. Somebody else, y'all come on. Somebody else. Say, God, I'm sorry that I've judged you as being somebody critical in my life. And I've not looked at you as a daddy. Somebody that understood me. Somebody that cared about me. Somebody that didn't want me to perish. Heavenly Father, meet the need as only you can. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God, this move. God, this move. Help us all, Lord. Help us all, Lord. We... But there's times, Lord, when we pray that our best prayers is when we don't speak a word. We just allow our minds to commune with you, Lord. Blessed be your name forever. God, move, 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 Lord, as so you can help us to allow you to move. Blessed be thy name. Blessed be thy name. Wonderful grace. Wonderful grace. Wonderful grace. Grace, meaning unmerited favor that you have bestowed upon us. We love you, Lord, and we appreciate you. Thankful for how that you've moved. Somebody's going home this afternoon and going to spend some time with you, Lord, alone. That's all right. Blessed be your name. Amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. Let see. Let me fall in love with you all over again. Let me love you as never before. Let me come in 
Let me willy he open the door. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I tell you what, we've been in the